Welcome back to this podcast edition of 12 Days in March. This material was delivered during a series of live lectures at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. In this recording, we'll review the key features of Lyme disease for the USMLE Step 1 exam. As with all presentations, a PDF of this recording is available at the 12 Days website. All right, let's do ticks and related infections. Tick-borne disease and Lyme disease. You need to know the tick, Exodes tick. They actually ask ticks. You've got to have a slide for ticks. I'm not crazy. You need to know, believe it or not, some people don't recognize the name of the spirochete. Borrelia, please know the name. Borrelia, and do know that it's a spirochete. Borrelia burgdorferi. So three phases here, early localized, like right after the tick bites you, then it disseminates, but it's still considered early disseminated when it goes elsewhere in the skin, um, heart and nervous system, and then late disseminated, mostly in the joints. It can hide in the nervous system too, but they're not going to ask you about that. Good, so three phases. Background, oh, my, so my microbiology here, the reason I'm showing you this, they're not going to ask you this, you're not going to have to know this. The only reason I'm showing you this is because when you order the test, they come back with these bands. It's always bands, IgM, IgG. IgM, you have to have two of three, IgG, five of ten. What the hell are the bands? The bands are made up from different proteins, structural proteins, heat shock antigens, plasma encoded antigens, P outer surface uh, protein. Uh, but you don't have to know this. I'm only doing this because it's going to be all about these bands seen. These are antigens seen on Western blot analysis. So here is a typical test that will come on back, IgM. You can see in this one, uh, reactive only on one, not two. Uh, but IgG is positive across the board. So this patient probably has an infection, but it's already getting into the disseminated phase. And they love Bell's palsy. All right, and so this is just the life of a tick. Okay, and let's start right here with the eggs. So the eggs hatch, and they become larvae, and the larvae wake up, and they take a little meal from the mouse that happens to be strolling nearby, right? The larvae got infected from the mouse, grows up to a nymph, and now that nymph is going to feed off of some other mouse that's not infected and infect it. So it's one big happy family. Larvae gets infected, nymph infects the mouse. These are the reservoirs, okay? And they need a blood meal, and they don't actually eat that much ticks. They don't have big appetites. So that's how the tick gets infected. Then it grows up, and it becomes an adult. And they eat, they love deer, it tastes like chicken. So they eat deer. Deer are not a vector. They, they just, they're innocent bystanders in this because the ticks love their blood. Okay, so it's really the, the, the tick and the mouse is where the uh, infection is harbored. From the human point of view, so that infected nymph or the infected adult then bites us, and it's really got to be attached for a couple of days to transmit infection. And it finds us by CO2 and warmth, so stay cold. Early localized, tick mouth bites your skin, and that's where you get the erythema, chronic migraine, rash, plus a flu-like illness. So that's the isolated rash that happens right after you were bit, 3 to 30 days after exposure, not disseminated. Disseminated, so early and late dissemination, early days to weeks after the exposure, so you have the inoculum, the Borrelia grows, multiplies, and then disseminates to distant sites. And so it can spread to the skin, heart, and nerve. So like when it goes to the heart, they're not going to say, look, the patient has conduction disease. They're going to describe a patient who has heart block in the summer, carditis rarely. Peripheral radiculitis, cranial neuritis, Bell's palsy, they love the damn thing. It can cause meningitis too. And then the late disseminated, basically the Borrelia, it down -re regulates the antigens. So the organism down regulates antigens and it just hides. And the late manifestations are really immune system response to the remnants of the uh, spirochete. Persistent infection, knee again is common, big effusions are classic. So here are the, the pictures, but these, these are the good ones. So everybody knows about the target rash. That is classic, but that one's less frequently seen. This is what people come in with, this big confluent erythrodermic rash. And this is early localized, so the groin behind the knee. But it's big, it's not subtle, it's warm greater than four centimeters. Then on the skin, now it's early disseminated, that's when people come in with these multiple lesions all over their body. But this is already disseminated disease. The other issue, people come in after tick bites all the time, they have this. Everybody with tick bite has some manifestation, they say, oh, you know, what is this? That's, you know, foreign body response to the tick bite. That's not erythema chronica migrans. Um, and all I have to say, in the summer months, undress your patients. Any febrile patient you see in the summer months, get them undressed. I had uh, one guy presented with disseminated disease, 
And it's like he's sending me these emails. I'm having a fever to 102, 104. I say, you got any skin rash? He says, no. I say, well, come on over. And I undress him. It's like, Jerry, you got these things all over the place. He goes, huh. Oh. You know, he didn't know. So you got to undress these people. And look, index of suspicion. So heart block, third degree heart block. It can be first degree, but third degree is how they're going to do it on the boards. You got P waves and you got no QRSs. There's no correlation between the two. You can get a cardiomyopathy. A, it's rare, but remember, any cardiomyopathy on the boards, they're not going to say, hey, you got a cardiomyopathy. S3, RALS. Mitral regurge because of a dilated annulus, uh, JVD, et cetera. They can get pericarditis too. So disseminated, slowly disseminated, that's cardiac, lymphocytic meningitis, Bell's palsy, and just FYI, they'll never do it on the boards. Uh, but you get these people coming with these plexopathies, sacral plexopathy, a brachial plexopathy, and you think, yeah, it's post-infectious, post-viral, you don't know what it is. Check them for Lyme. That's missed. Nobody ever thinks about it. And then the joints, acute monoarticular arthritis, big effusion. Take-home message on this, I've already told you. It's a, you don't find the bugs in there. It's an inflammatory synovial fluid analysis. 25,000, half of them are PMNs. Negative cultures, negative crystals, negative gram stain. So diagnostics, you don't see it on light microscopy, heart to culture. They may describe silver stain, not really. Serologic testing, a lie that gives false positives. Western immunoblot is how we do it diagnostically. They never ask you any of this stuff. They're telling you basically the patient has clinical manifestation of a tick-borne illness. They might ask you about treatment, doxycycline. But what they do like to do is talk about the co-infection and a plasma. Babesia is a co-infection that's not covered by doxycycline. So for Babesia, they've got to give you more information. Lastly, antibodies persist. Once you've got the antibodies, you've got the antibodies, so we don't just keep going back and rechecking. You have to have the clinical syndrome. And so do be familiar with co-infection, and that's where we're going. And that concludes this discussion of Lyme disease for the USMLE Step 1 exam. If you have any questions or concerns, please email me at 12 Days in March. Thank you.